people to get here last time. There was a pileup on a freeway of some 10 cars, and they seemed to choose me for the middle point in them. So it was hard to get extricated. Uh, to make up for that lost hour, and also because I think we ought to get in some more classwork, I'm going to suggest that we expand our meetings from two to three per week. Uh, and that starting this week, we meet not simply on Mondays and Thursdays, but on Wednesdays as well. As well. And uh, if it turns out that we still are skimping, we'll make it four times a week. I had hoped, you see, that I'm sure you understand by this time that I'm groping here as much as most of you, I gather, are. Uh, we have not given this course before. It's very hard to set little guidelines for it. I had hoped that uh, we would stir up some um, reasonable amount of activity in individual meetings in my office. And a few of you have come around, but not enough of you to justify dropping two class meetings per week. Uh, if we develop more office activity in the uh, uh, home stretch here, uh, we'll allow the class schedule to be flexible. But I think from here on in, we ought to count at least on three meetings a week, and we'll see about whether we go to four. Are there any questions about anything at all before we get into our subject today? Anybody having any problems? We left off last time talking about the humanist spirit and humanist developments of the 19th century as having been a contribution almost exclusively of the working class movements of that century. I don't think that statement requires any qualification whatsoever. In the period of the most hectic flowering of capitalism, the spirit of the most vicious exploitation prevailed, and it was only the counterbalance of demands posed more and more militantly by various working class movements that restrained otherwise unbridled capitalism in its reduction of the human being to an animal condition in any degree whatsoever. I think we can dramatize that point very simply. You are sitting here in a state university receiving an education essentially free of charge, unless Mr. Reagan manages to alter that circumstance, thanks to the working class of the 19th century because free universal education was not part of the revolution brought about in our society by the American Revolution. It had to be fought for. It had to be fought for everywhere else in the Western world. It was fought for by those people who needed it most desperately, namely organized to fight for such things. This university and all the primary and secondary school systems developed from the humanist struggles of workers of the 19th century, but not only free universal education. Any rules and regulations we have written into the law establishing what is proper and what is improper in wage payments, in hours of work, in conditions of work, our contributions to us in our time by the working class movement of the 19th century. Any welfare systems for those who need welfare, any free medical clinics, any provisions for human need based on a consciousness of society that not all individuals can provide for themselves. That is a contribution of the working class essentially of the 19th century. 
If there are laws forbidding child labor, those are given to us by the workers of the 19th century. It is true that those laws get violated in more than a few areas. Anyone who has visited in Delano knows that a good part of the working staff in the vineyards is composed of people under age 16, sometimes as young as 10. So the laws are not perfect. But we can well imagine what the circumstances of labor would be like if the working class in the last 150 years had not fought against the natural logic of capitalist exploitation. That much said, it remains for us to try to interpret why the main carrier of humanistic spirit in the 19th century and indeed into the 20th was a working class. This is a question that relates directly to the problems we face in proletarian literature. Why did workers fight for humanistic orders of social relations? More and more, there has been a sentimental interpretation of this development in our time. It has been concluded by more and more intellectuals and note middle class intellectuals that workers have made, have conducted these struggles and made these contributions not because they were goaded to do so by economic circumstance, but because they have some inherent moral superiority peculiar to their class. Workers are somehow better people than the members of other classes. They have a livelier moral sense. They have a livelier sense of community. They are less ego-ridden. They are more oriented toward the community good than toward the individual good. They have a more enlightened sense of personal relationships. They represent, indeed, the fullest flowering of the Christian ethic the golden rule, and so on. I'm sure you've already begun to find in the proletarian literature you've been delving into this kind of sentimentality about workers. Let us establish very clearly that this has nothing to do with Marx's thought. Marx never made that moral judgment. Marx considered himself to be a political scientist not a moralist or sentimentalist. The Marxist interpretation of what moves the working class is economic. The whole spirit of the theory of dialectic materialism or historical determinism, variant terms for the same basic Marxist body of ideas, is that People are obliged to act in certain ways regardless of their moral principles, regardless of their enlightenment or lack of it, by their economic circumstances. Now, it is certainly true that many workers throughout the 19th century and into the 20th acted in a very different way from the behavior patterns of capitalists. But Marx interprets this to be the result of differing economic situations. If you consider what he called the social relations of production, you find that the capitalist who owns the means of production exists as an individual, that his enterprise was set up on an individual basis, owned and controlled on an individual basis. The whole spirit of his operation is individualistic. And you can afford to be an individual if you have that kind of economic power. Workers who have to hire uh, out their labor power, the muscle value of their hands and arms, cannot be individuals in this sense. If all you own in this world is your physical structure and not machines and apparatus and tools to make things, but only the hands to operate 
those machines and those tools which are owned by other people. You have no power to operate as an individual, to make demands as an individual, to take stands as an individual. There is only one way in which you can arrive at power, bargaining power. That is for you to unite with other people in the same uh, situation. To arrive at a mass strength because there is no individual strength. And so workers, when capitalism really began to develop, the Industrial Revolution really got underway, came together to form mass bargaining units, not because they were inherently superior moral beings who believed in community projects, as capitalists did not, but because they had no alternative. They could not make the boss listen to them unless they showed a muscle over and beyond the individual muscle of an individual worker. One worker could not close down a factory. One worker could not set up a picket line. One worker could not force management to sit down at a bargaining table. If you want to close down a factory, you've got to get all the workers out of it, or at least the bulk of them. This requires organization. So as a worker, you are driven to a certain communal sense, even if it is only in primitive economic form, to create an economic tool to give you some weight to throw around in the give and take of the class struggle. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, it sounded like you were saying that you only need individuals to have uh, a certain power in the workers The only way you can choose to be any kind of individual you want, even if it is a member of a herd, as a matter of free choice, rather than being forced to live that way by circumstance, is to be a capitalist of one sort or another to have some basic money power. There is no final choice in the relations of production uh, unless you have some degree of control of those relations of production. Now, if many capitalists, and indeed may, maybe almost all of them, choose to live in a herd-minded way, if they don't dare to stand forth as individuals, that is still in the area of choice. There are no such choices available to workers. A, a capitalist can choose to take a, a, year's, a year off and take the grand tour of the continent, travel around the world. He can choose uh, to busy himself at uh, art production rather than uh, commodity production. He can become an esthete. He can do anything he wants so long as he has a guaranteed income. Uh, and therefore, it is not an accident, I think, that almost all artists in our times and perhaps in all times, certainly in all recent times, have come out of some kind of reasonably moneyed situation and a fair number of them out of the top capitalist class. Very, very few workers become artists because the period of preparation required, the amount of leisure required, are not available to them. But there are other explanations for that. So many, many the others. environmental situation goes, you know, I mean, the emphasis on art, I don't think. Absolutely. Art, art has been largely a middle class and bourgeois product. Because they've had, sure. you know, all this wealth to indulge in. And, sure. Uh, you know, they this sure. And besides, it was not until okay. recently that the people of the working class were allowed to acquire enough education to be able to absorb works of art. And I think we can, it's, it's fair to say that even today, most people in a working class do not get sufficient education to be able to absorb and understand most of the art products of our time. This free education that the 19th century worker struggled for, it seems like it's been corrupted by the ruling class again to perpetuate yeah, the class that's another matter. I wouldn't quarrel with that, absolutely, sure. But the fact is that the institution was established because of a working class pressure, and sometimes very militant pressure, 
Democracy. I didn't mean I didn't mean to imply that because the demand was finally won, that therefore the institution belonged to the working class. Far from it. Far from it. Uh, Mr. Marcuse has a few things to say about that. There's a possible alternative. Don't you think that, but don't you think that if this were to be done, the same mentality of middle class would then become the mentality of these that were in the working class, had all these problems? Well, that's not only theoretical, but we see that the bulk, bulk of the working class in this country is middle class. Sure. Okay, sure. The middle class mentality sure. is that great. That's what I'm saying, is that, that sociological things would change. But you see, we're, ta we're talking now about revolutionary, essentially idealistic concepts of what the human condition might be but is not yet. Now, central to those concepts is the idea that if a really revolutionary alteration of society took place, it is conceivable that a classless condition might be created. In other words, we're not talking simply about the advancement, the progression of upper layers of the working class into the middle classes. We're talking about the ideal of a society in which classes are abolished because primarily of altered economic circumstances. That is to say, if there is no more private ownership of the means of production, if it can genuinely be brought about that the whole of the people own and control the means of production through their own constituted authorities, then the social relations of production as we know them disappear. There may be specialized functions in relation to the means of production, but there will not be one controlling group and as against one working group. Nobody will then be simply hiring out his labor power to somebody else uh, who has the money to, to purchase it. That is the ideal. We can talk at length about whether it is ever, we've ever come close to it even in revolutionary situations. I would deny that we have. I don't think that we have significantly approached that goal in the two vast areas of ex revolutionary experiment, namely Russia and China. I think that new class societies have been instituted. I don't think anything approaching communism has yet appeared in the world. But we're not talking about theory, because it was theory that moved the proletarian novelists of the 30s, and not any reality, historical reality. That's a matter that can certainly be discussed, but it takes us far afield from what our concern because we are dealing with a set of writers in a period of intense economic depression in the 1930s who became so disillusioned with the economic structure of the society that they refused to think about improving it. They decided that improvement was impossible and that the whole thing had to be overthrown. Now, that is the area of revolutionary ideology that we're concerned with because it generated the literature we're concerned with. Uh, the question you raise is the quite legitimate one. It has to do with the problem of reformism against revolution. And it can be talked about at length. But the people who generated the literature of the 1930s were not reformists, they were revolutionists. The revolutionary change of the 30s was not degenerated I think that's largely true, yes. And yes. Is there a reason that you know of <laughs> why it's, it's evolved again? You're talking about which revolutionary changes of the 1930s? You're talking about the revolutions that took place elsewhere in the world? No, I'm just talking about the, the, the ideas of the men and other people that, that felt this way as opposed to what, what happened what became of the 40s and 50s. 
and what is re-emerging as idea, ideas today and, and ways of life even. It seems sure. like a communal thing and not just hippie type communal thing or political type communal thing. Yep. Yep. But I still don't quite understand the question you're raising about that. Why why there should be that pendulum swing? To speculate, really, just abstractly, because we haven't got time to get concrete. I think that it's probably um, built in to the revolutionary process that things should fluctuate between a period of intense idealism when it's thought that everything is possible, we can make everything anew, uh, remake not only society but the human animal. Then periods in which such experiments are tried in a practical plane, as in Russia and China and so on, and disillusionment sets in because the ideal is not arrived at. And so people begin to turn either intensely inward, personal, or to think that if the experiment is going to work at all, it has to be done on a very modest, highly local basis. A few of the right people might be able to do it, whereas it seems to have been impossible to do it with a whole society. So I think that there is the pendulum swing between the idealistic certainty that all change is possible on the one hand, and then the despair that it's just not happening, and so we'd better get a little group of people together and see if we, the good ones, can make it happen very privately. I think also that there are certain historical processes that, like, a society can remain viable as long as it can incorporate enough reforms, enough changes, you know, and it can survive quite nicely, which is essentially mm -hmm. what happened in the 30s. It, you know, they come up with FDR, and, you know, that was fine. So went over most people, the mass of the people, into a reform today. I think what's happening now is, that, at least as I see it, is that the government is becoming increasingly um, rigid. Nixon and, and the whole structure seems to going into a complete, into increasingly ri more rigid and repressive bag instead of a reformist, um, you know, well, we'll incorporate this into some other new thing which will be liberal and better. You know, we're going, and I think that's why you see more and more revolutionaries is it were emerging is because the society, that, that isn't happening. I think, I think what you're saying is partially true, but I think it's an oversimplification. And here I think Mar Marcuse, Marcuse is valuable as a corrective. Marcuse recognizes, I think, as much as anyone does, that this is an increasingly repressive society. But the nature of the repression is more complicated than it was in the 30s and particularly in McCarthy times. And I think it's essential that you examine why repression has become more complicated. The Marcuse logic, I think, is this. That in a sense, this society is becoming hideously more flexible. It has become such a mammoth, so powerful, that in many ways, it even stimulates discontent, encourages discontent, encourages rebelliousness, knowing that it can reach out and suck it in. Uh, yes, the Nixon administration seems to be a much more conservative and hidebound one than the two that preceded it. However, it reaches out for Daniel Moynihan to be advisor on uh, the war against poverty. Uh, it's the first administration to put forth, even in incredibly truncated form, the idea of a guaranteed annual income. Uh, I think if you examine the rebels you have observed over the last few years, You'd be astonished to find how many of them have been incorporated into the structure of authority today. Some, a student of mine uh, a few months ago was telling me about an interesting case history. Uh, you may know this guy. I don't remember his name at all. But some two or three years ago, he was editor of the, uh, the Bruin here on campus. Do you know about his progress? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was apparently a most eloquent spokesman for uh, the most radical kind of libertarianism. And he was uh, the leader of the left around here. And then apparently, because he, was, he showed a flair for journalism, he went and got himself a job on Time Life in New York. Okay, now at the ripe old age of what, 22, 
He considers the situation over the course of a year working for Time Life. Well, you know what the situation is in such a structure. If you're very good, uh, over the course of 10 years, you will rise to the position of something like senior editor with an income of something like thirty-five or $40,000. Well, he thought this over very carefully and cold-bloodedly and said, that's not good enough. Whereupon, he quit his job, a job that there are thousands of young people scrambling to get, you can be sure, and went in and enrolled in the Harvard Law School with what in mind? To become a corporation lawyer, in which field he will obviously make a lot more than thirty-five or 40000 a year. Well, you can see that without attacking the ideas of libertarianism themselves, they serve a function in preparing people for uh, the establishment, sometimes. There's a, what I think at least is a beautiful example of that going on in this campus. Um, there's a program called HENAC, which is a very interesting program. It's very experimental, has some very interesting copies, and it's funded in, in majority at $75,000 from the Ford Foundation. And absorbed in that, are most of the people, or, or a goodly number of the leadership people, who were involved last spring in the Campus Park issue and the, and the coalition as it were, and put together a fairly effective mass movement for a short time. Over the summer, they got together with the PNAC, and they are now almost completely absorbed in the, the bureaucratic running of this program, and there's, the coalition still exists and still trying to function, but it's seriously hampered by a lack of some very effective leadership, which is now being put, paid quite nicely to put together this Well, I think we all recognize it as an endemic problem, uh, and it arises not from the iron-fisted repressiveness of the establishment today, but rather from its arrogant flexibility. Uh, it feels so powerful that in many areas, at least, is prepared to allow the most radical kind of thinking, and then will simply carefully observe the leadership and skim off uh, the cream of the leadership for its own purposes. And more often than not, those people uh, offered irresistible blandishments are just going to go. The decimation of leadership, I think, is the most hideous problem facing any revolutionary movement today in this super affluent society. There are too many temptations elsewhere to people who demonstrate ability to cause trouble. Well, I'm trying to establish that the working class up until very recent times has made an enormously powerful, essentially humanist contribution to our society, and that without it, without its countervalences, capitalism would most likely have taken a form of outright fascism almost from the beginning because its whole spirit is inherently that. I'm trying to establish further that this does not in any way argue for a moral superiority of workers. Here I take an almost completely Marxist point of view. I think workers have no alternative but to form at least primitive communal values if they are not to be simply crushed by the uh, machine of the establishment. But let me point out, if I may, how dangerous is this kind of sentimental moralism about the working class when you find it amongst middle class rebels, particularly artists. Let me give you some examples. Some years ago, Jean-Paul Sartre in his most revolutionary phase, which meant the phase in which he was fully reconciled to the official communist movement, wrote about himself in pages of his magazine, Les Temps Modernes, 
in the most self-flagellating sense. Why? He denounced himself with utmost nausea for his uh, upper middle class background, for the fact that he came from a rentier class, that is a coupon clipping class. And he announced that he only felt the possibility of becoming human when he began to relate to revolutionary working class movements. And indeed, he announced that existentialism, as he began to see it, was a humanism. And he found that communism had all along been a humanism. And at this point, he saw that existentialism had to relate itself to communism or could not find a base in true human values. That you could become human only by fully allowing yourself fully to be absorbed into the working class. I think it's pretty clear that he never did that. But there was a period of incredible pseudo-proletarian romanticism. Now you'll find that the proletarian literature of the 1930s abounds with this spirit, which has led to disastrous conclusions, disastrous both politically and aesthetically. I want to give you these examples. You know that some of the proletarian literature, possibly some that you already read, concerns itself with the Okies, who came out of the Dust Bowl of Oklahoma when their topsoil blew away in the middle 30s, and they could no longer could scratch a living out of the land. And by the thousands, they got into their Model Ts, their various jalopies, piled their few belongings and their families aboard, and took off for California to become migrant work farm workers. You know that uh, Sartre's two strike novels, I mean Sartre, I mean Steinbeck's two strike novels are concerned with the Oki migrant farm workers in California, primarily in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and the famous one, of course, is Grapes of Wrath. The earlier one is uh, In Dubious Battle. Now, the essential view of this segment of humanity was that indeed they had started out concerned with individual problems, each man scratching for himself uh, and ready to ignore the others or even to pit himself against the others, uh, a self-interest, uh, the kind of spirit that dominated the American mentality from the beginning except that this was among bottom dogs, or recently made bottom dogs, rather than amongst capitalists, but that in the course of struggle against the most vicious kind of exploitation, the struggle to form a union, to strike for at least semi-human conditions, they began to forge a solidarity of spirit, they developed community values, they became better human beings. Now I think there's no question but what? The experience of participating in a union struggle, any organizational struggle in a working class, uh, can have profound inner effects. But to consider, to argue rather, that there was a transformation of human material, and what's more, by implication, a lasting transformation, is to yield to a very dangerous kind of romanticism. Look at the facts. If you go to Delano today, you find a most intense, really harrowing labor struggle taking place. A new generation, migrant farm workers of various sorts, not only Mexican-Americans, but Mexicans brought in from Mexico, and uh, some Indians, and some Filipinos, some Negroes, even some Arabs, because in those circumstances, the owners, the growers, reach out for the cheapest labor available all over the world, and even go to the Arab lands for it. You find them locked in a life and death struggle, not to form a union, they have the union organized, but to get the union recognized. And they're completely stymied because for all the strength that working class movement has had in this country, organized working movement, it has never been able to get migrant farm, to get rural labor in general brought under the jurisdiction of the National Labor Re Relations Act, which was passed in 1935 under Roosevelt, simply because the 
agricultural interests, agribusiness interests are so powerful, and so they are stymied, and the growers are lined up very solidly against them. And now you examine the personnel amongst the growers, and you find that a surprisingly large number of them are Okies who came to California in 1930s and fought these labor struggles. Where, where in the emotional treatment of these materials by Steinbeck will you find such understanding of character, such development of the internality of human beings as to allow for the possibility that quite a few of these people could have become capitalists, forgotten entirely the labor struggles they, they participated in, and played the role of the growers they fought themselves once, the vigilantes, the growers organized against them, and so on. Learning absolutely nothing from history, not caring to learn anything from history. Their values have not at all been upgraded above the general level of capitalist values by their proletarian experiences of the 1930s. I'm trying to argue that any novelistic treatment of such people, which does not see the people so richly as to see these potential in, potentials in them as well, has been produced within romantic blinders and become a literature of symbolic romance rather than a literature that deals with people as they are. Another example. In your reading, you may have become familiar with the fact that toward the end of the 1920s, one event, as much as any other, made middle-class intellectuals class-conscious and a brought them to the communist movement and got them prepared for the effort of proletarian literature of the 30s. It was what appeared to be a legal matter. It was a Sacco Vanzetti case. These two bottom level Italian immigrants in a suburb of Boston, devoted anarchists of the 19th century sort, <coughs> One of them a fish peddler, the other, what, anybody remember? Uh, some kind of bottom level worker. They were arrested and they were very active as anarchists, passed out pamphlets, made speeches on street corners and whatnot, representing the more naive tradition of humanism of the 19th century. And somewhere very early in the 20s, they were arrested and charged with a payroll robbery in which uh, one and one man or two, one man was killed or two men were killed, I don't remember. The man, the man carrying the payroll and uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, the guard who accompanied him. Now this became the most famous legal case of the 1920s. It was taken up by the working class everywhere, by working class organizations everywhere. The, the point of view was simply that these two men were being framed because of political reason and there was much evidence to that effect. Judge Thayer, who presided over their trial, was quoted as having said in private, we've got to get these anarchist bastards. This is not a rumor, this is established as fact. And the, the trial was conducted in an atmosphere of hysteria, and the main tone of the trial was political. Get these guys because they're anarchists. Sure. I don't, I don't know if there was very much in Boston, but there had been out in this part of the country. Uh, there was the Tom Mooney case, the case of the McNamara brothers bombing the Los Angeles Times. Wasn't there also a, a series of bombings in Chicago? I there was. Some what? It, was, it was like a McCarthy in the 20s. That's right, but that was early. That was a Haymarket riot. Yeah. They were the, the end of the 90s. But there were many other. There was the Ludlow massacre and a, a mining strike in Colorado. What's that? The yeah, but it had been an awful lot of, of uh, uh, the most extreme violence in labor struggles around the country. And it was very easy to pin uh, the responsibility for all of them on the anarchist bastards. 
Uh, there's no question about what. Uh, this trial was a railroading. These two men were absolutely moving in the way they conducted themselves. If you want to read some of the most moving prose ever written by workers or anybody else, read the volume of collected letters of Sacco and Vanzetti written from their death cells. Many intellectuals, most particularly John Dos Passos, were very active around this trial, organizing defense committees, raising money for defense, and on and on and on, participated in the trial, wrote about it voluminously afterward. If you've read Dos Passos USA, you will see that the central public event is the Sacco Vanzetti trial. It is what finally mobilizes some of his people to become full revolutionaries, and it's what mobilized Dos Passos himself to become a full revolutionary and participate briefly in the very early 30s in the organized proletarian literature movement. Okay. Now, we develop a considerable scholarship on the Sacco Vanzetti case, and I must say, a rigorously objective scholarship. Now that the event is long since removed in time, people step in and say, let's gather all the facts and see what truly happened without any emotional hysteria and without any side taking. And the fullest treatment, the most scholarly treatment of this case was published a few years ago. I don't remember the name of the author. It's called Tragedy at, uh, at uh, Dedham. I think that's the name of the suburb. Cheatham, Dedham, something like that. And the conclusion is that one of these two men certainly uh, killed the victim or victims. And it's conceivable that both of them did. In other words, that there was a real event, uh, a, uh, an attack upon two men carrying a payroll. And that the attack was carried out certainly by Sacco, I think, possibly by Vanzetti with him. Nowhere in the enormous <clears throat> romantic literature of the 20s and up into the 30s both fiction and nonfiction, will you find any consideration of the slight possibility that these men, no matter how they were railroaded politically, might truly have carried out this payroll robbery and the killing of the company. Nowhere is in the treatment of these people in or out of fiction are they dealt with as such complex human beings that in addition to being idealistic romantic anarchists. They might have used guns in a payroll robbery that had no political significance. I say that again is a failure of nerve, a failure of insight, a failure of the intelligence on the part of artists who have tried to deal with these materials. I think it's perfectly legitimate to maintain to this day that these two men, so admirable in many ways, so courageous with their own kind of working class eloquence were indeed martyrs in the revolutionary cause. But all the same, maybe they were murderers as well in a non-political case. Exactly. 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 Right. No, the blacks just spit on them because there was no reason, right. you know, they were impinging these irrelevant middle-class values on a situation now. That's what I'm trying to say is the basic failure of the proletarian literature of the whole 1930s. And if anybody wants to make a try at it again, it's the first pitfall he'd better avoid. Mike? Yeah, uh, I was thinking all of you were talking about Sacco and Vincenti, that uh, the classic martyr, martyr of the early 20th century, Joe Hill, was very probably guilty of the murder. That's right. That's right. And, the That's right. and the, they had all the evidence you know, within the time itself. The point was, if the trial had a few legal, you know, uh, uh, with the word flaws, he was almost certainly guilty, and he took it. Sure. Like, like sure. Man, you like, like this now you know, you know that non-political crime is very often associated with revolutionary political movements. Uh, there was a big issue in the Bolshevik movement uh, in the early, um, in 1912 or thereabouts, having to do with bank robberies, which, by the way, were led usually by Stalin. Stalin. 
Uh, and, uh, and it became a big ideological question. Should a revolution engage in outright criminal activities to finance itself? Uh, the, the conclusion was never clear cut. They were, but you see, even in our own time, only very recently, uh, we've seen bank robberies and other uh, illegal efforts to raise money for causes uh, amongst militant groups. Uh, the Panthers uh, have no doubt been accused of this much more often than they've done it. But apparently, in a few cases, it has happened. And uh, the uh, Ron Karenga people have done it apparently more than once. I think you'll find it elsewhere if you look closely enough. But my whole point is, what a remarkable novel you might get if you wrote about, say, a Sacco and a Vanzetti and considered that indeed they might have pulled some kind of robbery and even killed people along the way and uh, concluded that they were infinitely more complex people than had ever been allowed for in the writing about them. What does it feel like to a, to a revolutionary anarchist to pull a gun and kill a bank guard uh, or, or a, a payroll guard uh, who is a worker? Not precisely the kind of manual worker that we're talking about, but a worker against whom he has no personal animus. Think, think of how you could explore the mentality of such a man. It's not even a matter of, uh, of value judgment, of side taking. It's a matter of trying to see everything that exists inside one human head. None of this was seen by proletarian novelists of the 1930s. Another obvious example of the inadequacy of characterization of the working class because of romantic blinders is the fact that in the 1930s everybody considered that the working class was a wave of the future was in short order going to take power everywhere in the world and produce a whole new classless society. That wave of the future has not materialized as we know, except in a very few side pockets of the world. And even there, the issue is as yet in doubt. We don't know what will finally happen in Cuba. In any case, we know that in Cuba, it was not the working class that carried out the revolution. It was rather guerrillas recruited from the peasantry. Uh, on the other hand, although that romantic, starry-eyed vision of what was going to happen in the near future, due to the initiative of the working class, has not been realized, we do know that by the millions, Organized workers in this country voted for George Wallace in the last election. Uh, something wrong with the romantic vision of the novelists of the 30s, as well as the uh, revolutionary politicos. Sorry, I can't hear. Yep. It's a great deal of talk yep. about alienation, how the government screwed sure. workers. Sure. Sure. You don't have anything to say. Sure. You know, very, it's, it's all very revolutionary. There's no. There's no. It has been said. It has been said that the sentiment amongst the unionists who voted for Wallace was one of a displaced and misplaced radicalism. That it wasn't a sense of radical vote. You can see the logic there. But the point is that such devious possibilities were not foreseen by the novelists who wrote about the working class in the 1930s. Well, and that, certainly not the racism that developed. That seems sort of a funny view of it. Maybe they could view the other people who voted left wing as a misplaced conservatism. <laughs> What's that from, well, from, from, their, from the other point of view? In some ways, I could be argued, sure, because many people who, who turn to the left are libertarians, and libertarianism, in a sense, is a very conservative philosophy. Any, any philosophy that uh, makes the individual sacred is, a, is, in a sense, a conservative philosophy, except some people feel that you have to fight for that uh, idea with revolutionary means today because the idea is no longer uh, viable in the society at large. Sure. Well, all right, so remember, please, that we meet now three times a week. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday.